The server closes its socket, and then your browser can take that HTML and render something. So that's basically, you know, that's all HTML is. It's a simple text description of how to render a web page. Okay, now at this point, uh, they're both in a static state. Um, the socket is closed, at least in older web browsing and still today, if, if you're not using web sockets, but um, forget about those. They don't really matter in this, for this class. Um, and then you can go and start typing stuff into your browser, into the form on the browser. Uh, that's still all static and offline until you click the button. When you click the button, it's going to create a new socket and say, all right, uh, I have a different query for you now. I want to, um, I want to go to google.com slash search with a query of how to internet. The, the server, google.com, will decide how to interpret that. So it's like, oh, okay, I have this parameter called Q, query. How to internet, it'll go do all of its super fancy web searching magic and give you a reply. Um, 10 tips on how to internet better is actually the, the real top hit, at least when I did this a while ago, a while back. Um, okay, so anyway, super basics, just, you know, how, how is this working, just so you have an idea of what you're doing. Um, so let's write or look at a very, very simple web server. And I know most of you have probably seen this. This is just a quick review for most of you. Um, so here's a web server where I have, it's, it's going to return like two very simple web pages. Um, but in order to use HTTP, I have just some constant hard-coded strings, the OK header and the bad header. So like if it knows what your request is, it'll give you a 200 status. If it doesn't, it'll give you 404, not found. So I just have those hard-coded so that I can build my response using those strings. Okay, here's main. All it does is start up an asynchronous loop that will accept connections. That's essentially, that's a TCP listener. So it's listening for uh, connections on the HTTP port. When a connection comes in, it's going to run this handler, handle HTTP connection. So here's that. It's essentially just a trampoline point where, okay, I got a new connection. Now I will ask for data on that socket. And here is what will happen when data arrives on the socket. Um, it's just, and it's HTTP is all text-based. So it's, I'm basically just dealing with strings. So I get the request that the browser sent. So that's going to be something like, uh, this get. Um, I, you know, print some stuff to the console just saying what's going on. And then the basic function of a web server is look at the request the browser sent and decide what to do. So here is if the request was just get slash, then, uh, w you know, with the rest of the HTTP protocol stuff in there, then I will serve the home page. So send and close, send something over the socket, then close it. Here is the home page with a simple H2 uh, HTML header. Otherwise, if it's get slash players, then I will send the HTTP OK header plus something here. We'll go look at that helper method a little later. Players, in this case, is referring to chess players. So this is like a little uh, chess browser over the web instead of in a native Windows form app. Otherwise, so, you know, if, else, if, else. So if I don't recognize the request at all, then I just send the bad header plus page not found. So super simple web server logic, just deciding what to return based on the request. 
So let's go look at get players HTML. Um, I make a return value with just an empty string to start, and we'll fill that in. So what players, what this web server is going to do is it's going to act kind of like, a, well, it is going to be a chess browser. Um, so get players is going to just return every single player in every known player in the database. So I do this, you know, standard stuff we've seen: create a MySQL connection with the right connection string. Um, and then my command is just select star from players. Okay, and then for every row returned, I loop over the rows using the MySQL reader, and then I just do result plus equals the player's name. So name is one of the columns in the rows returned by that select star from players query. And then I just return the result. So let's just run that. And again, I'm going through this pretty quickly because this is not a web servers class, but just to give you the basics. So I'll open up a browser and I will go to localhost. Here is a web page. So that's, uh, you know, get slash. If I go to localhost slash players, uh, it just gives me all the players. Very formatted in an ugly way because it was just plain text. And I didn't even put spaces in between them. But there, there's all the players. And if we look at the web server, we can see I just have some console.writeline statements in there to say what's going on. Here was that first request, get slash. Here was get slash players. There's a lot of other stuff in here that my web server is ignoring. So all this stuff was sent by Chrome. My web server only cares about that little part right there. That's how it decides what to return. OK. So that's just plain text, though. Usually you want to return some HTML that a browser can display uh, in a better way. So what you would do, so we have a dynamic query here. We have select star from players. I don't know how many rows that's going to return. Um, I do know a little bit about the structure. Like I know it's going to have a name for every row. Um, so I can't just like hard code some HTML and return it. I have to dynamically create some HTML based on a database query. So let's, let's do that. Instead of returning plain text, Let's make some super simple HTML. So I'll put in a table. I'll, I'll start with my result is just the begin table tag. And then for every row, I will make a, for every row in the returned query from the database, I will make a, an HTML table row. So that's just. Um, TR for table row. And my table is only going to have one column per row. So then I will do TD to start the table column. Then I will put in the name. Then I will put in close the column, close the row. So slash td slash tr. OK, so all I'm doing there is basically wrapping, wrapping every player's name inside of td and tr. Ah. OK, and then finally, instead of returning just result, I need to close my outermost table tag. OK, let's try that. Now I'll just refresh this page. OK, so now we get it in a nice table format. 
I didn't put a border on the table, so it just looks like new lines, but you could. Anyway, not really the point. Um, just to give you the basics of what a web server is doing. So, let's go back though and think about the design of a proper web server, or really the design of any proper software. Um, the most important principle in software engineering is separation of concerns. So the basic idea is um, take pieces of the software that are only somewhat related to each other and separate them into kernels or modules. The most basic example of this is you write functions when you're writing code. Like why do programming languages have functions? So that you can modularize some part of the process and give it a name and call it from other places and connect modules up. Now, like it would not be possible to write complex software without separation of concerns. Um, in a web server, the formalization of separation of concerns is called, an, is an architecture called model view controller. And I know you've probably seen this before, so just a brief recap on it. The basic idea is the main concerns are the model, the view, and the controller. So the view is like, what do you see? And how is it displayed? How is it rendered? Um, so we just, we just saw, I changed the view. The original view was very ugly. It was just player names, not even space separated. I just changed the view a tiny bit, and now it looks a little better. The model didn't change. Uh, the controller didn't change. Well, they shouldn't have anyway if they were properly separated. All of this stuff was in one function, and that's the wrong way to do it. Um, in this class, the model, the, the model is essentially the entire point of this class, right? The database is the model. So we're, we've already studied lots of ways of thinking about how to model data. The relational model, entity uh, relationship model. We've, we've thought about the proper way to design how do you store data and that's essentially the model of a software system, such as a web server. The controller is like the logic. So, you know, user clicks on some, something in the interface. Um, the controller decides what kind of query to produce in order to get the, the data that the view will need. So, again, kind of why, like why separation of concerns, but why specifically MVC? Um, what if you want two different ways of displaying the view? Or more, more likely, what if the view is changing fairly frequently? And that's, that's common, you know? You go to a web page um, every, every few months or every year or so, like the look of the web page might change. Um, what if you want to unit test the logic? If you had, like we have here, All of my logic, in fact, like everything, model, view, and controller is all pretty much in one function. Um, so what if you wanted to unit test this? Like, yeah, this is a pretty simple query and there's, it's unlikely you got it wrong. But what if this was a little more complicated where there's some where filters on here based on some, some inputs uh, and you wanted to unit test that you're getting the query right? You couldn't unit test it because you have to go visit a web page just to execute that logic. So separating the logic into its own separate concern, meaning like its own class, its own function, will allow us to unit test it. And then what if we wanted to divide the programmer workload? So you know, you've probably heard the term uh, front-end developer, back-end developer, or full-stack developer. Um, front-end developers and back-end developers are working on different parts of essentially of MVC. In this class, specifically, uh, I'm providing the entire view for you, and you're just writing the controllers. And 
without MVC, you would have to know a lot more about how the view is working. And uh, so be glad that you don't. You, you're basically writing controllers. So let's look at the chess browser as a simple example. Um, so the views, let's look at the views. I have some screenshots here from two different, completely different ways of displaying a chess browser. This top screenshot is the web server version, kind of like what we just wrote. That's just a screenshot of Chrome. The bottom one is a screenshot of uh, Homework 5, the native Windows app. But you could imagine putting all of these buttons and fields and stuff into a web form instead of a Windows form. You'd get two different views, two different ways of implementing the front end of a chess browser. The controller for the chess browser are those essentially those two methods you're filling in in Homework 5. Perform query and upload games to database. That's where you decide how to produce the queries and what, how to combine logic and stuff to, to get the right filter. And then the model is those three tables in the database. Events, games, and players. So we've already put a lot of time into, into getting the model right. Like all of the keys, the foreign keys, the data types on all of the columns, that's done. Okay. So, kind of generalizing this a little more. Um, the model is not just the database, like once we start putting software on top of it, we have the pure model in the database, but then we would also have, we would need to have some way of representing or at least accessing that model in software, in C Sharp. We'll get to that, that's basically what, kind of what this week is about, is how do you take the database model and deal with it in C Sharp. The view for a web server is things like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, and then the controller is logic and queries. Um, so it's not just database queries. The other kinds of logic in the LMS, for example, is say somebody's trying to create a class in the LMS, um, and you have to make sure that that class doesn't occupy the same room as some other class at the same time. Um, I told you specifically to not try to do that with table logic. Like you could do SQL triggers to, to maybe make that work, but it's easier to do it in software logic. So that's what we'll do. Stop me with any questions, by the way. Okay. So let's take this tiny web server example and at least start making it use MVC. I won't go all the way, we'll just kind of look at it quickly, but basically what you would do, the problem here is um, here's, some, here's some controller logic and here is some view concerns. So I have, I have controller concerns and view concerns both jammed into one place. It's violating MVC. Um, what you would do is I'll come over to my solution explorer. Here's my web server solution. Um, you could do this by making another project or the way I'm going to suggest is just make folders for the separate concerns. So let's add a new folder called controllers. And inside of controllers, I'll make a class. So let's just make a um, database controller. Okay, there it is. There's my skeleton class. But essentially, I want to take this whole method, or at least we'll start by taking the whole method and then extract out certain parts of it. And we'll put that into the controller. And I'm not going to get it all compiling and everything. Like I'd need to add some references and stuff. Just, just going through the basics of refactoring the code. 
So first of all, this is a controller method. So now the name is, is essentially wrong. Controllers should not have anything to do with HTML. That's a concern of the view. So this should now, this should only return players. Then the view can take those players and decide how to display them. So we don't want this. This is HTML here. That's a concern of the view. And in fact, we should probably not return a string. We should return something like a list of players. And then instead of putting all the players into table rows in HTML, we would just do something like, now it's a list now, so we do something like result dot add new player, you know, with the uh, appropriate name and LO and stuff like that. And then just, we, do, we don't have this, that's a concern of the view, okay? Now I've got just controller concerns inside of my controller. Back in this, so let's say this is the view. Now I don't need any of this, like the MySQL connection stuff, making the query and everything like that. Um, all I would do is something like DB controller dot get players. And then, you know, so like players equals that. And then I do something like for each player P in players, um, you know, table row plus P dot name or something like that. You know, this is where we build up the HTML. It's now a completely separate concern how it is displayed versus how it is extracted out of the model. Okay? It's more um, like what's the benefit from having like a player class versus like just instead of returning a list of strings of their names? Yep, good question. So what what are the benefits of having a player's class versus returning a list of string? There's actually are not really any benefits, and this is still not quite the right way to do it. This is just to give a basic idea of what you might do, but that is, yes, that brings up a great point. There's a problem with this. Um, this means the view needs to know how the model is implemented. If, so you mentioned the alternative is like, what if we just return strings? That would be better, because then you don't need to know anything about the C-sharp um, fields or methods or anything that the controller or model has. So we will actually get to that today. Um, this is, this was mostly just about separating the code into view and controller. Now the question is, what should be the interface between view and controller? How should the controller tell the view what the data is? And we'll, we'll get to that, yep. Um, first though, uh, doing this manually, like going making a controllers folder and moving stuff into that class um, is already kind of not the right way to do it, at least not in Visual Studio, because Visual Studio directly supports MVC web servers. So let's just make one. Um, let's go over into somewhere where I can make a new a new project. Okay, and then I'll make a new solution. ASP.NET Core Web Application, so it directly supports web applications. I'll just call it Lecture 13. Oh, that name already exists. Let's call it simple MVC or something. And now the font is going to not display this very well, but um, there are different, th different types of web applications you can select. 
this one, you can see actually the letters MVC right there. It directly supports creating an MVC web server. And Visual Studio is really bad at handling large fonts. Um, like I have the font set so that it looks okay in the editor window, which means it's like way too big in little pop-up windows and stuff. Anyway, here's the solution structure that we automatically get. So <laughs> it gives us controllers, models, and views. I just, I zoomed in on it just so you can see. Um, but you know, that's all built in. So this is like, this is like the hello world of web servers. It's all auto-generated. I can run it, and so look, notice now it says IIS Express. That's .NET's web server. And it'll take half a minute or so to compile for the first time. When you run it, it automatically launches a web browser and then points the web browser to the random local port that it assigned. It's still loading a bunch of libraries. So, you know, it looked really easy. There were like two clicks to make a web server, but there are actually like hundreds of libraries involved to make that happen. Okay, so here's the hello world of, of web servers. Gives you just some simple boilerplate HTML, some links and stuff. Okay. Um, let's look at the code. I guess I'll stop it for now. So inside of controllers, we get home controller. We're gonna look at that. Inside of models, we get just this thing called error view model. That's, there's really nothing to that. There's not much there. Um, I haven't specified any models yet. The idea though is going to be, we're going to point it to a database and it will use the database as the model. And we'll see how to do that. Um, and then in views, I get home slash index and privacy. So let's just look at index. Index is like the root level. If you just go to, you know, whatever.com slash, that'll take you to index. Here it is. This is the whole index page. So here's some HTML, um, with a hyperlink in there. Um, However, let me zoom in on this, actually. So look at the file name, index.cshtml. So this is actually, this is not pure HTML. This is C Sharp and HTML in one file. And that's what this stuff is up here. That's actually C Sharp. So this view data thing, that's a C Sharp dictionary object. Um, and, and then there's some HTML. So anytime you see an at sign inside of a CSHTML file, that says, here's some C Sharp code. And the point is, uh, it's kind of like jQuery, if you're familiar with that. The point is to be able to like dynamically uh, rewrite the HTML using a programming language. So, Let's actually, let's actually just do that. Let's see, let's see that in action. Um, so inside of this main div, um, and again, like if you're not, if you don't want to know what a div is, you don't really need to, you don't, you're not gonna be writing any HTML. Um, I can put an at sign saying incoming C sharp code, and I can just start writing like a for loop. So I'll just do like five things. And inside my for loop, um, oh, actually, so before the for loop, let me make an unordered list. So unordered list is an HTML thing. It's basically just uh, like bullet points. So I'm gonna dynamically create some bullet points using a for loop. So I'll make a list item. 
And inside of my list item, I will just use that C sharp variable I. So my bullet points should be uh, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And for some reason, when I'm recording and connected to the projector, this always takes like twice as long. Um, it will not be this annoying when you're, when you're doing this on your own. Okay, so there's my web page now with some dynamically C-sharp generated HTML inside that CSHTML file. So this is called Razor. Microsoft calls this Razor, the ability to mix C-sharp and HTML. Uh, essentially the same idea as jQuery, like using JavaScript to dynamically rewrite the HTML. Okay, let's go look at the controller now. So this is all the view. This is the home page view. Let's look at the controller. It has essentially two methods, uh, index and privacy. Those are, those names are special. They are not just any old names. Index is the controller that runs when you visit the index view or the home page. Privacy is the controller that runs when you run, when you visit the privacy page. So if you were to go to, you know, whatever.com slash privacy, it'll automatically, .NET's web server will automatically run this controller. Um, they're not doing anything interesting right now. They're both just saying return view, which means they'll automatically go and find the view file with the same name. So index controller will return index view. So it means it'll display this HTML. But the controller is where like database queries should go and logic about how to decide what to give back to the view. So you could imagine doing something like um, run some fancy database query, um, extract certain rows, or maybe get all the rows or something like that, and then pass info to the view. So there are various ways of doing this last part, this pass info to the view part. The coolest way of doing it is this thing I mentioned, this C-sharp dictionary called view data. We, we can access that from the controller and from the view. So if I were to do something like view data, uh, so make up some variable name, x equals hello. Now in my CSHTML file, I can access view data X. So I'll do it, uh, I'll just put another item down here in my, in my unordered list after the for loop. I'll do a list item and I'll just put in view data X. So this is kind of just a cool way of passing information between the controller and the view. Was there a question over here? Yeah. So we're going to use view data. We're going to also use um, another way we haven't actually seen yet, not the view bag. We're going to basically return something to the view. So that return statement that just said return view you can put something in there. That's another way to give data back. And that's actually mostly what we'll be doing, but we'll be using a little bit of both. So there's my little hello. Cool. Um, so what you could imagine is instead of view data x equals hello, you could do something like view data x equals result of the database query, or something like that. And the database query could be dynamic based on the URL. 
So like certain parameters inside the URL saying like student ID equals this, uh, class ID equals that or whatever. Um, so to illustrate though, like how would that work? So what is the type of view data? View data is a dictionary. The keys are obvious, the key is string. What are the values? I can do this. So I can put a string in, I can put an int in. Uh, it's, it's a dictionary that maps string to object. Just the, you know, top of the, the type hierarchy object. That's how it's handling being able to put anything into the view data dictionary. So, or maybe, I, maybe I'll do something like this, view data, some var name equals, you know, some custom object or something like that. Now let's go see how, what implications that would have in the view. Um, so if I were using, you know, my, what did I call it? Some var name. Um, all that's going to do is invoke to string on that object because the only thing this knows is that whatever it gets out of that is an object. So the best thing it could possibly do is just say, well, we'll use to string if we're trying to print it. To string usually just returns the hash code or something like that. Um, so if you knew that some var name uh, was a key referencing a chess game object, then you could do something like, um, okay, we'll do view data as chess game, cast it to a chess game, and then you could do like dot um, moves or something if you wanted to display the list of moves for that chess game. Now this is starting to kind of be a problem. This is um, concerns of the model are starting to leak into the view. I would have to know that there's something called a chess game, a C-sharp object called chess game. I would have to know that it has something called uh, moves. Um, you know, maybe that's okay for simple purposes, but the goal is to keep these things as separate as possible so that you could go and totally rewrite the view. And as long as there is some agreed on, agreed upon interface between the controller and the view, then you could rewrite either of them in you know, whatever way benefits it. Like maybe you need to totally re-engineer the controller to make it faster or something. You can do that if you decouple the view from the controller, which means we need an interface. So here's basically a simple diagram showing what, what we just did. Um, Oh, I guess I use chess game instead of chess player, but let's say we're trying to pass a player back to the view. Um, so the model has a class called player, which we know has a field called name. Okay, so if the view knows that, then you could write some little C-sharp code for each player P, uh, en enter in a table column using p.name. But that means the view has to know about the model. Here's a, Here's what it's going to look like in this class. Maybe team number one represents it that way with a player class in C Sharp. Maybe team number two doesn't have a player's class and they just pull out a list of strings from the database. Um, how are they going to tell the view what to display? Here's the problem is I provide the view to everyone. So I'm not going to provide, you're not going to have a different view if your model is different. So look at the difference. One of them is iterating over player objects, one of them is iterating over string objects. We need some common interface so that no matter how you represent your model, like I don't know what your tables are, I don't know what classes you'll make in C Sharp, you need to be able to tell the view what to display. So in the true spirit of separate concerns, um, these things should be completely decoupled. 
other than the one interface saying like whatever the whatever data the controller pulls out of the model, it needs some way of telling the view what it is. So we already have a solution to this, and this is a slide from like the first day of class, structured versus unstructured data. Structured data just means that um, every instance of some type has the same, has all the same fields. So every student has a name, a major, a GPA, and an ID. And a really easy way to uh, represent structured data is just simple text and you put, you, you include the structure into the data itself. So it's called self-describing data. And that's, this is an example of that. Self-describing because it has a name and I'm saying that a name is a string. Um, major is in the data and I'm saying that major is a string. So the tags and the data are all in one, self-describing. Um, However, a web server doesn't actually need types. A web server is essentially just displaying text. Like even if it actually was a number, it's just gonna display it as text digits, you know, two point whatever. So this is all we really need. We need a field name, colon, field value. That should be the interface between the controller and the view. And it's all just text, so whatever C-sharp object you have that represents a student. Maybe it doesn't even have a field called name, but somehow you have to just produce a string saying name, colon, and then some string. And we, we already know a good way of doing that. We just use JSON, JavaScript object notation. So it's, it's a general solution for self-describing data. It's essentially a bunch of angle brackets and tag names and field values. So as an example, like here's one JSON object, angle brackets surrounding the whole thing, the tag name in quotes. So the tag name in this case is name, capital N, and then colon, and then the value, Carlson. All right, so here's a, an object with three fields, name, LO, and status. JSON directly supports nested objects and arrays, so Again, no, not really any types. Array is maybe kind of like a super fundamental type, but it, it essentially supports objects and types. And to make an array, we just use square brackets. So if I wanted um, an event, I could say the event has a tag called name with a value of world championship. It has a tag called games with a value of an array of other JSON objects. So how do we pass the model to the view? We don't do it with C-sharp C objects, we do it with JSON, and that achieves the decoupling that we need. JSON is just plain text, and then any kind of representation of the model in source code can be translated into JSON and passed to the view. All right, any questions? You've all seen JSON, right? Okay, yeah, question? So again, I'm kind of just very quickly going through this as a recap, because um, you'll need to be, you'll need to use JSON to pass the result of your controller queries to pass it back to the view. So whatever they do,
Um, all right, so how is this all working in .NET Core? So .NET Core is the framework that um, we'll be constructing our web server. So .NET Core has like all of the web server stuff, parsing the URL, um, accepting the socket, everything like that. You're, you're doing none of that. So a URL comes in, say the URL is foo slash bar, question mark, x equals 1, y equals 2. So there's a path and then there are two parameters. The web server IIS Express is automatically going to decode that. So what it gets out of that is the directory is foo, the page is bar, and then view data x equals 1, view data y equals 2. Okay? It'll pass that into, um, which means, it, so, sorry, it won't pass that into. So it, it decided the directory was foo and the page was bar. So that means it will go to, inside of views, it'll go to foo slash bar. So see that, that path there. And that's like actually the file path on the server. We can see those paths here. So we have like views home slash index. It'll automatically kind of convert URLs into paths. And then the way, the way I'm going to produce the views is I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use a lot of something called Ajax. You don't really need to worry about that, but it basically how it works. Um, here is the, the essential view that it's going to return. There's an empty table. So I have table tag, close table tag with nothing in it. And then I have this thing here. This is pseudocode kind of for an Ajax query. Essentially what that means is your browser is going to see that and then make another web request saying, give me, um, run the controller called get x. So then it'll go back to the web server and say, okay, go invoke the method called um, foocontroller.cs slash get x. So here's that method. That method will do some database query. It'll return some JSON. Then your web browser, using JavaScript, will dynamically rewrite this table based on whatever was returned from that controller. And if that's confusing you, don't worry about it too much, because again, you're not going to be writing any JavaScript or Ajax calls. But the, what to take away from this is uh, IIS Express, .NET Core, is doing all of the like basic web server stuff for you. Decoding URLs, deciding which view to return, deciding which controller to run. Your job is essentially this. Write the contents of various controllers and return JSON. I will give you the exact format of the expected JSON that's, um, that you're supposed to return. So we will look at that. Here is the actual LMS, one of the controllers. So we've already looked at this a bit in the past. Um, here's another one. So this is the get catalog controller. So that's like, if you remember, when I run the web server, there's a, there's a link at the top for catalog that shows all of the departments and all of the courses within. This is the controller that will produce that at least the data that the view then converts into HTML. So we will uh, examine that, but let's take our break right now. And this, this started by, I used Visual Studio to create an MVC web server project, and then I filled in a bunch of JavaScript and stuff and controllers. I've already logged in, so here's the student homepage. But remember, we were looking at we were going to look at this get catalog controller. And there is a solution down here. I'll maybe show a couple lines of it. Um, 
So it's not just doing nothing. The solution is down there, but hidden. So it's, you know, it'll work. So if I click on catalog, that controller just ran and returned a bunch of, a bunch of JSON to the view. And then the view took, took that information and built all of these tables and these links, uh, and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, it's actually normally going to look kind of more like a reasonable web page. Um, but your, your only job is to run some database query, return some JSON. And then it'll automatically look like this. So here's the controller, and here are, here's the documentation for it. Essentially, the instructions that you're given. So all the controllers you write will just have uh, XML comments describing what to do. So this controller returns a JSON array re representing the course catalog. Okay. Each object in the array should have the following fields. Subject, so like CS, D name, department name. So sub subject is the abbreviation, CS, department name is like School of Computing. And then a field called courses, which is itself an array of JSON objects representing the courses in that department. So that's essentially how it knows how to split these tables up. So here's a department. ART is the abbreviation, ART is the name, bio, biology, and then here are the courses within each of those departments. So inside of each course, there should be um, an array, or inside each department, there should be an array of courses. Each course has a number and a course name. Okay? So you'll just produce a big JSON string following exactly that format. Um, let me go over to catalog.cshtml, that's the view. And there's gonna be a lot of stuff in here that you shouldn't worry about, but let me just show the very basics. Um, Ajax, so I talked about that a tiny bit. This means the web server is going to return sort of like a template for this web page first, which doesn't contain any of those tables. Then your browser is gonna see this. That means go make another request to the web server and specifically invoke the controller called get catalog. So the name is very specific there. Get catalog means it has to match the method name. So it's gonna invoke that controller. So we'll get some result back, some JSON result. And then all this stuff is like dynamically rewriting the HTML based on that JSON result. That's not the part you need to worry about. Um, the only thing you will ever need to do in these view files is for, to help with debugging is you might want to uncomment these alerts. So all of the views will have these alerts which will instruct the browser to display the JSON that your controller returned. So it's just a pop-up window in the browser. So I will do that. I'll uncomment the alert for that controller, or for, the, for this view. And then I'm just going to refresh the page. Okay, there's my alert. I know you can't see that, so let me copy it into something we can see. And it's a little uncooperative, hard to select the whole thing, but I'll try. Oh, that's enough. We'll just use that much. And I'll just go over to a text file, and let's paste that in, and then examine it and kind of reformat it. So the controller said should return a JSON array, OK? There's the opening of an array. Inside of that array should be something called subject and DNAME and courses for each uh, department. So let's just kind of reformat this. So subject art, 
There's the global array. Subject art, department name art, courses is itself a nested array with number 2740, course name, digital imaging. Okay, so there's one object inside of the array for uh, the art department. Here's the next object inside that array. Um, so you get the idea. Okay, as long as you return JSON formatted correctly, then the view will work. Is there a way to make sure your JSON follows the right format? Yes, so you, we haven't gotten to this yet, but we're gonna be writing our queries using link in C Sharp, which makes it essentially trivial to do this renaming. So if you need the JSON to have something called C name, but your C Sharp class is called course name or class name or something, make, making the mapping to do that renaming is, is trivial. So you're not gonna have to write a bunch of messy code that goes and like puts in, manually puts in braces and brackets and renames things and stuff like that. In the catalog? Oh, right, so, okay, so what's going on here? So this is the, this is the Ajax query. This is, this is the directory that the get catalog controller is in. So student slash get catalog. And that, so the, you know, these are just like strings, uh, but the names are very important here. This is how the web server knows what controller to run. It's purely based on names. So you do have to get that right. I mean, you don't. I had to get that right, and then you can just use my existing code. Yeah, controllers, yep, controllers can take parameters. Uh, this particular one doesn't, because it doesn't matter which student you are. But yes, there's, there are plenty of examples of that. Okay. Now, we've been examining, in the context of MVC, how, do, how does the controller and the view interact? And the model is obviously deeply involved in that. Um, but we've been kind of ignoring the model itself. We've been talking about just how do you decouple the communication between the controller and the view. So let's focus on the model now. Um, and I said earlier that the model is basically the whole point of this class. Like the database is the model. But in order to make it easy to use inside a programming language, um, you also need a C-sharp representation of the model, so not just the tables on, on the ATR server. So how will you, as an example, to, to decide like how this is gonna work and what we should do, um, let's think of a scenario. How will you prevent two classes from overlapping in time and space? So not occupying the same room at the same time. Um, the way we've been writing SQL queries in C Sharp is you use this uh, like MySQL data reader and then you execute the query and then loop over the rows using a while loop or something. But the thing returned by the data reader is, is not really like a C Sharp, uh, it, it's, it's not an object that directly represents your model. It's one row at a time, and inside of that row, you can access individual columns. So let's say you did select star from players. What, really what you want is a whole bunch of C-sharp player objects, like player.name, player.lo, and whatever. But what you get is, um, what you get is you have to access it like this, reader, name, you know, something like that. 
what you want is a player object which contains basically all those fields, like a name field, an LO field. Um, and that just, the reason you want that is it'll make this easier. Writing logic about, like, I used players as the examples, that's, um, you, but this is uh, referring to LMS classes. So you, you would want an, a C-sharp object representing LMS classes. And then you could easily, so let's say you do have that. Let's say you've written a C-sharp class that essentially mirrors the classes table in the database. So classes has a semester, a location, a start time in, in the table. It has all that stuff. You would write a class in C-sharp that mirrors that. So class would have semester, start time, and so on. Then you can easily write C-sharp code. Um, so let's say you're trying to add a new class. So you give it the location and time and then you look at all of the existing classes and just like, you know, make sure that the locations and time don't overlap. A lot easier to do that if you have a C-sharp object called LMS class than if you had to do something using like an SQL reader and like look at all these fields one at a time and stuff like that. So if you look at this, though, um, this for each loop is sort of implying that I have, in my C-sharp program, I have some container called classes that has like an entire copy of the whole classes table from the database. The way I've written this, that's how it looks. And, you know, maybe it's an IE numerable. It's some kind of collection, a hash set or something. Um, we do want to be able to write C-sharp code that looks like this, rather than doing something like go query the database, then for each row in the class's result, uh, do this logic. It's a lot easier to think about it if you can just do this. So for now, pretend that we do have a copy of the entire database in C-sharp. We've written C-sharp objects that, that mirror the types of all the tables, and then just done like a select star from everything and filled in a bunch of C-sharp collections. That's obviously not how it really works. It looks like that, so pretend it does for now. Um, so then the question, another question comes up. So, so this is how do, you, how do you do preventing overlapping classes logic? Another question that comes up is how do you then convert the result to JSON? if you were using a MySQL reader. You'd have to go row by row, column by column, like filling in, manually filling in JSON, versus if you just have an LMS class C-sharp object, C-sharp automatically supports JSON serialization. You just run this function called JSON. It automatically looks at all of the fields, all of the subfields, and just gives you everything you need. So it's trivial. So the point I'm making is, We want to write C-sharp classes that mirror the database tables. Two simple examples of that. Here's the students table and the enrolled table. They have SID, name, GPA, so on. You could imagine easily writing C-sharp classes that kind of represent the same data. So you create a class called students. It has an unsigned int SID, it has a string name, um, a float GPA, okay? So two different ways of representing the same data model. And so should we, so there are two schools of thought for how to design this. Should we start by designing the tables or should we start by designing the C-sharp classes? That's called database first versus code first. Um, what we did is database first. We designed the schemas using the relational model and the ER model, and then we made tables. Now we can take those tables, and it's a pretty straightforward translation to classes, like we saw. You just look at the columns, you just give a field for every column, and match the types. The other way to do it is code first, where you design the algorithms and classes first, 
then translate that into tables. Um, it's not like one is correct and the other is wrong. It's um, what is the main concern of the problem you're trying to solve? Is the data model more interesting? Or is like the code and the algorithms more interesting? Or more, more of a challenge to solve? For an LMS, the data structures and the algorithms are basically non-existent. It's, it's like the whole thing is the model. So we did database first. Um, the good news is it's very easy to convert both ways. You could start with tables and convert to code. You could start with code and convert to tables. And the even better news is um, you don't have to do it manually. There are tools to automatically do it. So you can just run this tool, say, point it to this database, and it will automatically go and generate C-sharp code that represents those classes. Yeah? If you do code first, should, should you convert it back to a relational model? Somewhat, yes. In, I mean, if you do code first, then the, the data model is probably going to be quite simple. And that conversion will be either trivial or very easy. And you can just go and decide what the keys and foreign keys should be. Um, but yes, you should at some point like kind of try to at least write an ER diagram and make sure that it matches what you ended up with tables. Uh, so behind you. A good example of when you'd want to use code first. A specific example. Um, hard to come up with one off the top of my head, but the basic idea is like if performance and like the algorithms that you're going to need to run require like very custom, advanced, or sophisticated data structures, then that's the bigger concern and you're going to want to start there. So a specific example, I don't know off the top of my head. Give me a minute and I can think of one. Can you go from ER diagrams to classes? Yeah. That's, that's still DB first. And this, this whole process is called scaffolding, of automatically converting a database representation into a code representation. So let me show you how that works. I have this project called Scaffold Demo. Um, you can see here it's got controllers, models, and views. All this is, all I've done is I created a MVC web server project, and that's it. I've done nothing else to it other than I added a reference to get this tool. Okay, down here, and let me make the, let me make this readable. <coughs> down here I have a, this is basically PowerShell, this is a, this is a terminal. Um, and I can run commands from here, well, I'm gonna have to actually do something real quick first. It doesn't like my keyboard scheme in the PowerShell, so I have to change it. Okay, I'm gonna run this command. Scaffold DB context. And then the rest of this is essentially a connection string. So which server we're using, which database we're using. And then this is what tool do we wanna to use to do the scaffolding. Remember, scaffolding means examine a database and automatically convert the tables to C-sharp classes. And then I say the output, output directory is models. So that's referring to this models directory here. So let me run that. And it would seem my, okay, it is running, good. And what happened there is, hopefully you saw, it generated all these classes, not error view model, that was already there. But I got chess contexts, events, games, and players, because the chess database has exactly those tables. So it's gonna turn every table into a C-sharp class. 
So let's look at them a little bit. Let me make that smaller. We don't need that anymore. Uh, let's look at games. So it generates a class. It's a partial class because some of it will be defined in another file. It already is um, in, in chess context, yep. Inside of that class, I get all of the fields corresponding to all the columns in that table. So round, result, moves. It knows the type. So black player is a uint. Uh, moves is a string. These are all just properties inside a C sharp class. Okay, let's look at players. A player has a name, a uint lo, a uint pid. There are a couple other things in here. So along with the fields, I also get a collection of game objects called black player navigation and a collection of games called white player navigation. That's because a player can play in multiple games as white or multiple games as black. If we look at the games class, a game has a single player called black player and a single player called white player. So it automatically knows just based on foreign keys, that this was a one-to-many relationship. So a player can have many games. A game can only have one of, of each type of player, white or black. Um, now, so we're running out of time, but let me leave you with this. So this code here is just a class definition. That's all, it, that's all the scaffolding did, is it gave me the definition of a class. There are no objects yet. There are no players, there are no games. Um, that part is yet to come. But what this is doing is this is getting to the point where it's gonna allow us to just write plain old C-sharp code using C-sharp classes that look like we just have a copy of the entire database inside C-sharp. It's not how it really works, but it will look like that. So we'll see how these objects actually get populated into collections and stuff uh, next time. We're out of time.